So, uh, the title is Time Crystals and Superfluids, but what I actually mean is time crystals in superfluids. And uh, this uh, computer-rendered propaganda image over here is not a horribly unrealistic uh, representation of what this is about. So this is a glass cylinder here, the real realistic size would be about six millimeters wide in the experiment. And uh, the two time crystals, in this case, the, the blue one and the red one, well, uh, in this picture they may have, uh, the, the light coming out might be, might be about a million times too high frequency in, in this version, but otherwise this is not very far from the truth. Um, and the reason I decided to talk about this particular work today is that it was actually done in uh, the Lotemp lab in, in Aalto rather than in Lancaster, where I currently work. Um, <clears throat> on the right you can see an actual photograph of the glass cylinder. It's about 15 centimeters long, and in a minute I will explain how this is used in the experiment. But um, <clears throat> I think we're going to need some sort of introduction to superfluids first. So, uh, well, there are two of them that we know of. These are the two stable isotopes of helium. And helium-4 is the stuff that you put in balloons. Uh, it's relatively cheap. Helium-3, then, is the fermionic version of, of helium. And that, um, in large quantities, such as those able to fill this, this tube with, with liquid, can in practice only be collected from degrading <coughs> nuclear warheads, or some byproduct of them. Uh, and so there are two sources, those are the US and uh, Russia. Uh, <laughs> And so both of these, these isotopes, they turn into a superfluid if you cool them down to a low enough temperature. A superfluid is essentially a system where um, the whole liquid is described quantum mechanically by a wave function, like we would describe, uh, for example, individual atoms, uh, usually. Um, Helium-4 superfluid is, is simple, uh, has been pretty thoroughly investigated, um, and is not the topic today. Helium-3, on the other hand, is perhaps the most influential large quantum system in the lab. Um, and there are plenty of things in the system that we still don't understand, although it has existed as a physics subject for several decades. Um, and the first problem which we encounter as an experimentalist is that to get helium-3 to the superfluid state, you need to cool it down to, well, preferably microkelvin temperatures. This is not particularly high, so that's some, some millionth of a degree above absolute zero. Uh, and that's, that's some task. Um, and the way it's done, this is a photograph of the machine we used in Alto. It's, it's still there. If you want to see it, you can go there. Probably, at least if you ask me first. Uh, <laughs> and the way this works is, um, this is about, let's say, a meter and a half, maybe two meters tall. And this piece, which you saw here, is, is over here to this, this part. Um, and then around that, well, first of all, we liquefy helium-4. So, uh, that can be done by using massive compressors and some nozzles that you let the gas through. Um, and then um, put that in a thermos container. We'll see that in a minute. I think, actually, it's over here. That's the, that's the whole cryostat. Um, and then we... Um, put a vacuum container around the rest of the cryostat, which allows then different stages to be at different temperatures when, when all gases are removed. And there are some components. So there's an evaporation stage. We pump helium-4 out from some chamber. That's the 1.4 Kelvin stage over there. Um, and then the, the um, lowest continuous temperature we can reach is achieved in this chamber here called the mixing chamber where curiously, if we, if we took, take liquid helium-3 and liquid helium-4 and mix them, the temperature drops. Uh, and so using this process, we can cool down without, in principle, any lower bound. And, um, and that happens in the mixing chamber, reaching, uh, in practice, maybe a few millikelvin, so a few thousandths of a degree above absolute zero. And to force, force these two to, to uh, mix continuously, then there is a distillation chamber a bit higher up there where we remove helium-3 and then we feed it back through some other, other channel and, and, and that goes on. But that's a few millikelvin, that's not enough. 
Uh, on top of that, then we take a large chunk of copper and put it in a very high magnetic field, let's say 8 tesla. Uh, it is, I don't know, a thousand times higher than the field of the, of the planet or something like that. Uh, maybe even more than that, I don't actually remember it precisely. Um, and then um, we cool it down to the temperature of the previous stage and then remove the connection and ramp the field down and the copper cools down uh, very cold and then cools the superfluid also. That's basically how this works. And the whole machine here uh, on the left is, when well, that goes inside the blue container, and then, well, this particular machine can be rotated, as you can see, makes fancy photos. It has nothing to do with the presentation today, but I will put it here anyway. Um, it's pretty much the only cryostat in the world which does that at these temperatures. Uh, now, um, if you get bored of fundamental physics at some point, uh, a, a, a cryogenic physicist or low-temperature physicist these days has another, always a kind of an other career option, which I'm just mentioning for entertainment. Uh, you may have heard of Blue Force. You may also have heard of quantum computers. Well, if you, if you see a quantum computer, they usually put, put out photographs like this. Well, that would be a Blue Force refrigerator, a commercial one. Um, and uh, the company was started about 10 years ago by Rob Blaugers, who just finished his PhD thesis in this group when I started. Um, it's very easy to move over there, but that's kind of boring. Um, <laughs> Now, I said um, helium-3 um, is a very complicated system when it turns into a superfluid. And um, to give you an idea of how complicated and what kind of surprising connections it has to seemingly distant fields in physics like cosmology, particle physics and so on, I stole this uh, page from, from the alto theorist Grigory Volovic over there. Um, and here, helium-3 is in the middle, I think you see. And then uh, pretty much all physics that you can ever hear about or learn about is around helium-3 and somehow connected to what, you, what, what the like, concepts or practical phenomena that you encounter when you study helium-3. Or which you can expect to encounter in certain conditions which may not have been uh, experimentally realized yet. Um, well, many things you will certainly not recognize here, but I'll pick one. Uh, the Higgs boson, which was discovered in CERN uh, in, well, about 10 years ago, well, that is a, a practical co uh, consequence of the so-called uh, Higgs field. Now, um, this many people probably know about, but what you don't know, perhaps, is that it was originally known as the Anderson, or well, the mechanism, which, was, which is called Higgs mechanism, is was originally known as Anderson mechanism. That was a superfluid theory idea, which works in superfluids. And then it was taken by Peter Higgs and fellows and then applied to the standard model where now uh, it makes a kind of cornerstone of that theory. Well, I could give you many other examples, but probably I don't have time for that now. Um, so, time crystals. Uh, what on earth are time crystals? Um, if you talk to a physicist, um, they will probably tell you that uh, time crystals were invented or first theorized by a Nobel laureate called Frank Wilczek. Um, and that this was more or less the first time that, that this idea came about. Now, they would be wrong. Because in reality, the first time on record that time crystals appeared was in the BBC TV series T Doctor Who in 1976. And I have this on my laptop, I can show you if you want. Uh, now, um, then, well, Frank may have refined this idea some, somewhat in his research paper four decades later, but, but, but that's what the real story is. Um, what are they then? Well, it will, um, I don't think I have time to go through the mathematical construction, which is interesting. But I will try to give you some sort of idea of, of what, what, this, uh, what this concept means. Um, a phase of matter is, uh, is basically um, something like liquid or solid or gas, which remains more or less similar in a range of temperatures and pressures and so on, until then there is an abrupt boundary beyond which it maybe goes from liquid to solid, for example, and that's going from one phase to another phase. So these are phases of matter. 
Now, Frank said that maybe we can find a phase of matter which is such that it keeps moving forever, repeating itself somehow periodically. And this is the defi defining so-called symmetry break, if you like, of a time crystal. Uh, just like the fact that uh, atoms are organized in with well, like, like regular intervals in a solid is the defining symmetry break of a, of a solid. Um, well, it was pretty quickly pointed out that this is essentially a perpetual motion machine. And so one should expect them to be impossible, uh, which is true. Um, <coughs> so they cannot be observed, uh, at least not in equilibrium. Uh, so in a steady system, which is well defined. Uh, but quantum mechanics is funny in that, um, that uh, we can, for example, reasonably talk about not observing the system, so closing our eyes, and then, then it may keep moving forever. Uh, and uh, another thing which is kind of maybe not so well understood outside physics always is that, you know, if you open a physics textbook, it will contain a range of concepts which describe the world. However, none of these can actually usually be taken literally. You need a physicist to explain or understand um, what these things mean, how do you actually apply them, and I mean, what kind of approximations or simplifications of, of reality they contain. So it's, it's not horrible if we, if we take in a concept which isn't, isn't literally correct and apply it to, to kind of gain understanding of, of, say, in this case, dynamic systems. Uh, at least not in principle. It may not work, but that's a different story. Um, so we want something which keeps moving periodically, um, uh, for as long as, as practically possible. And that, that's something we can do. Uh, so here is our glass cylinder. It's filled with helium-3, to some level at least. And um, then we have a couple of coils around it. And now it turns out if we take these coils and we drive in um, an oscillating signal, so basically we give a magnetic kick to the superfluid, these two blobs, or maybe one blob if we do it differently here, they appear, and then after that we can just sit around and look at the signal uh, appearing in the coils, because what's going on is we create certain magnetic particles, or quasi-particles, which means particles that can only live inside the superfluid in this case, and then um, what they do is they constantly like spin around magnetically, which creates a voltage in these coils. Um, and so if we take that signal from the, from the coils, uh, we can do some mathematical tricks. Um, well, people doing mathematics know what, exactly what I'm talking about, but I won't go in the detail. Um, so here, this graph shows what frequencies are contained in the, uh, some, some experimental signal we measured from that system. This is time in seconds over here. And this is the frequency um, of, of the precession where we've well, subtracted about a megahertz, so about a million hertz. Uh, and so then these two things here, the red one and the blue one, the blue one is, is, is this, and the red one is that. Um, so um, blue one is higher frequency as it should be. Well, that's uh, just an illustration trick. Anyway, and um, the, um, well, the, the, the interesting thing in this particular experiment was that, okay, if time crystals are, you know, you need to isolate them from the environment, you, don't, you, you cannot be looking at them or they will disappear. Well, can they have any sort of interactions was the question we were asking here. Or, or uh, are they kind of just, you know, something which isn't, which only lives in, in isolation? Turns out we can easily put two of them together in the same volume. They are touching a little, and so then they are exchanging particles back and forth between the two, two time crystals. And this sideband here is one phrase of the exchange for reasons which I don't have time to explain. Um, let's see what's here. Yeah, well, I've more or less used my 20 minutes soon. Um, and then, um, well, if you know quantum physics or matrix mathematics, this, um, this, this system of two time crystals is described by this, this funny little Hamiltonian over here, um, where these are the frequencies of the two things. Um, and those, that, that's the overlap, so this is the term 
uh, which tells you how well they're able, able to talk to one another. Um, and I think um, that's more or less all I wanted to say in my 20 minutes. So uh, we've gone from this um, practical thing to the abstract concept of, of time crystals. Um, thank you very much.